Daniel chapter 1. In the third year of Jehoiakim's reign as the king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, arrived in Jerusalem and laid siege to the city. The Lord allowed Nebuchadnezzar to capture Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, and seize some of the sacred articles from the house of God. These sacred items were transported to the land of Shinar and placed in the temple of Nebuchadnezzar's God, where they were stored in the God's treasury. Nebuchadnezzar instructed Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to carefully select young Israelites from noble and royal families. These young men were required to meet specific criteria. They had to be physically flawless, handsome, well-versed in various forms of wisdom, possess knowledge and insight, and be capable of serving in the royal palace. Additionally, they were to be taught the Chaldean language and literature. The king provided them with a daily portion of his own food and wine, intending to train them over a three-year period so that they could eventually serve in his court. Among these chosen youths were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, all hailing from the tribe of Judah. The chief eunuch assigned new names to them. Daniel became Belteshazzar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael adopted the name Meshach, and Azariah was renamed Abednego. However, Daniel was determined not to compromise his principles by consuming the king's food and wine. He sought the chief eunuch's permission to maintain a different diet. God influenced the chief eunuch to show kindness and favor to Daniel. Although the chief eunuch had reservations, fearing that the king might blame him if Daniel and his companions appeared less healthy than their counterparts, Daniel suggested a ten-day trial period. During this time, they would consume only vegetables and water. After ten days, their appearance was remarkably healthier and more robust than that of the youths who had been consuming the king's provisions. As a result, Melzer, the chief eunuch, allowed them to continue their diet of vegetables and water, discontinuing the king's food and wine. God blessed these four young men with extensive knowledge and wisdom, especially granting Daniel the ability to interpret dreams and visions. When the time came for them to appear before Nebuchadnezzar, the chief eunuch presented them to the king. Upon conversing with them, the king found none as wise and knowledgeable as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Consequently, he retained them to serve in his court. In every matter requiring wisdom and understanding, the king discovered that these four youths excelled tenfold compared to all the magicians and astrologers in his entire kingdom. Daniel continued to serve in the royal court until the first year of King Cyrus. Daniel chapter 1 In the third year of Jehoiakim's reign as the king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, arrived in Jerusalem and laid siege to the city. The Lord allowed Nebuchadnezzar to capture Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, and seize some of the sacred articles from the house of God. These sacred items were transported to the land of Shinar and placed in the temple of Nebuchadnezzar's God, where they were stored in the God's treasury. Nebuchadnezzar instructed Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to carefully select young Israelites from noble and royal families. These young men were required to meet specific criteria. They had to be physically flawless, handsome, well-versed in various forms of wisdom, possess knowledge and insight and be capable of serving in the royal palace. Additionally, they were to be taught the Chaldean language and literature. The king provided them with a daily portion of his own food and wine, intending to train them over a three-year period so that they could eventually serve in his court. Among these chosen youths were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, all hailing from the tribe of Judah. The chief eunuch assigned new names to them. Daniel became Belteshazzar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael adopted the name Meshach, and Azariah was renamed Abednego. However, Daniel was determined not to compromise his principles by consuming the king's food and wine. He sought the chief eunuch's permission to maintain a different diet. God influenced the chief eunuch to show kindness and favor to Daniel. Although the chief eunuch had reservations, fearing that the king might blame him if Daniel and his companions appeared less healthy than their counterparts, Daniel suggested a ten-day trial period. During this time, they would consume only vegetables and water. After ten days, their appearance was remarkably healthier and more robust than that of the youths who had been consuming the king's provisions. 
As a result, Melzer, the chief eunuch, allowed them to continue their diet of vegetables and water, discontinuing the king's food and wine. God blessed these four young men with extensive knowledge and wisdom, especially granting Daniel the ability to interpret dreams and visions. When the time came for them to appear before Nebuchadnezzar, the chief eunuch presented them to the king. Upon conversing with them, the king found none as wise and knowledgeable as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Consequently, he retained them to serve in his court. In every matter requiring wisdom and understanding, the king discovered that these four youths excelled tenfold compared to all the magicians and astrologers in his entire kingdom. Daniel continued to serve in the royal court until the first year of King Cyrus. Daniel Chapter 3 In Nebuchadnezzar's second year as king, he had dreams that deeply troubled him, causing him to lose sleep. He summoned the magicians, astrologers, sorcerers, and Chaldeans to interpret his dreams, and they assembled before him. The king explained that he had dreamt, but he couldn't recall the dream's content, which troubled him greatly. The Chaldeans responded, asking him to share the dream with them, and they promised to provide the interpretation. However, the king insisted that he couldn't remember the dream and demanded that they both reveal the dream and interpret it. He threatened severe consequences, including death and the destruction of their homes if they failed. But if they succeeded, they would be rewarded with gifts and great honor. They asked him again to share the dream, and they would offer the interpretation. Growing frustrated, the king believed they were stalling for time because he couldn't remember the dream. He issued a decree that they must reveal the dream to him or face punishment, accusing them of trying to deceive him with false and corrupt words. The Chaldeans replied that no one on earth could meet such a request, as it was beyond the abilities of magicians, astrologers, and Chaldeans. They stated that only the gods, who do not reside among humans, could accomplish such a feat. This enraged the king, and he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon, including Daniel and his friends. When Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, came to carry out the decree, Daniel asked him why the king's command was so hasty. Arioch explained the situation to Daniel. Daniel then went to the king and requested time to provide the interpretation. He promised to reveal it to the king. He returned to his house and informed his companions, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, about the situation. Together, they prayed to the God of heaven, seeking his mercy and asking him to reveal the secret. They hoped to avoid sharing the fate of the other wise men of Babylon. That night, God revealed the secret to Daniel in a vision, and Daniel praised the God of heaven. Daniel expressed gratitude to God, recognizing his wisdom and might. He acknowledged that God controls times and seasons, raises and deposes kings, grants wisdom to the wise, and knowledge to the understanding. He revealed hidden and mysterious things, having both knowledge of darkness and dwelling in the light. Daniel thanked and praised God for giving him wisdom and understanding, allowing him to comprehend the king's dream. He approached Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had been tasked with executing the wise men of Babylon. Daniel asked him not to execute them and requested to be brought before the king to interpret the dream. Arioch hurriedly presented Daniel before the king and informed him that he had found someone from the captives of Judah who could interpret the dream. The king, addressing Daniel as Belteshazzar, asked if he could indeed reveal and interpret the dream. Daniel responded, acknowledging that neither the magicians, astrologers, magicians, nor soothsayers could interpret such secrets. Instead, he asserted that there was a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and had made known to the king the vision of the future. Daniel explained that the king had a dream about a magnificent and fearsome image. He described the different parts of the image made of gold, silver, brass, iron, and a mixture of iron and clay. He also recounted how a stone, not cut by human hands, struck the image's feet, causing it to crumble and become like chaff, which the wind carried away. The stone grew into a great mountain that filled the earth. Daniel interpreted the dream, explaining that Nebuchadnezzar was the head of gold in the image. Following his reign, another kingdom, represented by silver, would arise but be inferior to Nebuchadnezzar's. 
Subsequently, a third kingdom, symbolized by brass, would rule over the whole earth. Then, a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, would emerge, breaking and subduing everything. However, this kingdom would eventually be divided, partly strong and partly brittle, just like iron mixed with clay. Regarding the stone not cut by human hands, Daniel revealed that it represented the God of heaven, who would establish an everlasting kingdom that would never be destroyed. This kingdom would replace all the earthly kingdoms, and the stone's impact on the image's feet signified its ultimate triumph. Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel, worshipped him, offered sacrifices and incense to him, and acknowledged that Daniel's God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and the revealer of secrets. The king honored Daniel with great gifts, made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon, and appointed him chief of the wise men in Babylon. Daniel requested that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be placed in positions of authority in the province of Babylon, while he himself remained at the king's gate. Daniel chapter 4 Inch Nebuchadnezzar the king sends his greetings to all the people, nations, and languages dwelling throughout the earth. May peace abound among you. I found it necessary to share the remarkable signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed in my life. His signs are truly magnificent, and His wonders are profoundly powerful. His kingdom is eternal, and His dominion spans generations. At one point I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my palace and thriving in my kingdom. During this time, I had a dream that filled me with fear. The thoughts on my bed and the visions in my head deeply troubled me. As a result, I issued a decree to summon all the wise men of Babylon to interpret my dream. Magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers came before me. I shared the details of my dream with them, but they could not provide an interpretation. However, a man named Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, entered my presence. I recognized that he possessed the spirit of the holy gods, so I revealed the specifics of my dream to him and requested its interpretation. In my dream, I saw a towering tree at the center of the earth, its immense height reaching the heavens and visible to the ends of the earth. It bore lush leaves and abundant fruit, sustaining all creatures. Beasts found refuge beneath it, and birds nested in its branches. It provided nourishment for all living beings. Within the dream, I also witnessed a watcher and a holy one descending from heaven. The watcher proclaimed that the tree should be cut down, its branches removed, its leaves scattered, and its fruit dispersed. Beasts and birds should depart from under it, leaving only the stump with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field. The tree would be drenched with the dew of heaven, and the one to whom it referred would have the heart of a beast, enduring this state for seven times. This decree was issued by the watchers, and the holy ones ordained it to demonstrate that the Most High God reigns over the kingdom of men. He bestows authority upon whomever he chooses, even the most humble. The dream deeply troubled me, and I knew that the wise men of Babylon could not interpret it. Yet I had faith that Daniel, filled with the spirit of the holy gods, could provide the interpretation. Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was perplexed for an hour upon hearing the dream's details. I reassured him, urging him not to be distressed by the dream or its interpretation. He then explained that the tree symbolized me, King Nebuchadnezzar. I had risen to great power and might, and my dominion extended to the ends of the earth. The watcher's message to cut down the tree and leave only a stump with a band of iron and brass signified that I would be cast out from human society and made to dwell with the beasts consuming grass like oxen for seven times. This was a divine decree from the Most High, intended to teach me that he rules over the kingdom of men. The interpretation further clarified that after this humbling experience, my kingdom would be restored once I acknowledged the sovereignty of the heavens. I took this counsel to heart, resolved to turn away from my sins, and show mercy to the poor, seeking to extend my tranquility. And so, as Daniel had interpreted, the events unfolded. After twelve months, I strolled within the palace of Babylon, boasting of the magnificent city I had built. But as I spoke these words, a voice from heaven declared that my kingdom had departed from me. 
I was driven away from human society, dwelling with the beasts of the field, and consuming grass like oxen for seven times, until I acknowledged that the Most High God reigns over the kingdom of men and appoints rulers according to his will. When the appointed time concluded, I lifted my eyes to heaven, and my sanity was restored. I praised and blessed the Most High God, the eternal ruler whose dominion spans generations. I recognize that the inhabitants of the earth are of little consequence, and God acts as he sees fit in both the heavens and on earth. None can question or challenge his actions. With my sanity restored, my kingdom, honor, and glory were returned to me. My advisors and nobles sought my presence, and I was firmly reestablished as king, with even greater majesty. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, offer my praise, exaltation, and honor to the King of Heaven, whose works are always true, and whose ways are just. He humbles the proud and exalts the humble. Daniel chapter 5 King Belshazzar hosted a lavish feast for a thousand of his nobles and reveled in the company of his guests, enjoying wine with them. As the wine flowed, Belshazzar ordered the golden and silver vessels that his father, King Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem to be brought. He intended these sacred vessels to be used by himself, his princes, his wives, and his concubines for drinking. The golden vessels from the house of God in Jerusalem were brought, and the king, along with his princes, wives, and concubines drank from them. In their merriment they praised the gods made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly, during this reverie, fingers appeared, as if from a man's hand, and began writing on the plaster of the palace wall, opposite the lampstand. The king, seeing this eerie phenomenon, was greatly disturbed, and his thoughts troubled him to the point that his strength waned, and his knees shook. In his distress, King Belshazzar summoned the astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers, declaring that whoever could decipher the writing and provide its interpretation would be adorned with a scarlet robe, receive a gold chain for their neck, and become the third ruler in the kingdom. Despite the king's offer, none of his wise men could read the writing or reveal its meaning, further unsettling Belshazzar and leaving his nobles astonished. At that moment, the queen, hearing of the king's predicament and the failure of his wise men, entered the banquet hall. She reassured the king and urged him not to be distressed. She recalled a man in the kingdom, Daniel, who possessed the spirit of the holy gods and was renowned for his wisdom and understanding, similar to the wisdom of the gods. King Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar's father, had appointed him as the master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. The queen recommended summoning Daniel to interpret the mysterious writing on the wall. Belshazzar agreed, and Daniel was brought before him. The king inquired if Daniel was indeed the same Daniel from the captive children of Judah, whom his father had brought from Jerusalem. He had heard of Daniel's wisdom and understanding, as well as his ability to interpret dreams and solve difficult problems. Daniel acknowledged his reputation and the king's offer of rewards but declined the gifts. Nevertheless, he agreed to read and interpret the writing. Daniel began by recounting how God had bestowed greatness, majesty, glory, and honor upon King Nebuchadnezzar, making all people, nations, and languages tremble before him. Nebuchadnezzar could elevate or humble whomever he chose. However, when Nebuchadnezzar's heart became proud, and his spirit hardened with arrogance, he was deposed from his throne and lost his glory. He lived among wild animals, eating grass like oxen, until he recognized that the Most High God holds dominion over the kingdom of men appointing rulers as he pleases. Daniel admonished Belshazzar for not humbling his heart, despite knowing this history. Instead, he had defied the Lord of Heaven by using the sacred vessels from God's house for a blasphemous feast, praising lifeless gods made of silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see, hear, or understand. Belshazzar failed to glorify the true God, the one who held his very breath and controlled his destiny. Daniel then revealed the interpretation of the mysterious writing on the wall. Emiani, Emiani, Tekel Aparsin, he explained. Emiani, God has numbered your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, 
You have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. A parson. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. In response to Daniel's interpretation, Belshazzar honored his promise and clothed Daniel in scarlet, placed a gold chain around his neck, and proclaimed him the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, King Belshazzar of the Chaldeans was killed, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom, being about sixty-two years old. Daniel chapter 6 Darius, the king, decided to appoint one hundred and twenty princes to govern the entire kingdom, along with three presidents, with Daniel as the chief among them. The purpose was to ensure that the princes would report to these presidents, preventing any harm to the king's interests. Daniel excelled among the presidents and princes because he possessed an exceptional spirit, and King Darius contemplated placing him in charge of the entire realm. However, jealousy consumed the other presidents and princes, and they sought to find a reason to accuse Daniel concerning his governance. Yet, they could not uncover any fault or error in his conduct, for he was faithful and blameless. These scheming men concluded that the only way to trap Daniel was to target his devotion to his God. They approached King Darius, addressing him with respect and longevity wishes, and presented a proposal. That a royal decree be enacted, establishing a firm law that, for thirty days, no one should petition any god or man except the king. Violation of this decree would result in being cast into a den of lions. King Darius agreed and signed the irrevocable decree, following the law of the Medes and Persians. Upon learning of the decree, Daniel continued his routine. He opened his windows, facing Jerusalem, kneeled before the Lord three times daily, and prayed, giving thanks to God, just as he had always done. The conspirators observed Daniel praying and approached the king. They reminded him of the decree, and the king acknowledged its validity given the unchanging nature of Mede and Persian laws. They accused Daniel, a man from the captives of Judah, of violating the decree and paying no regard to the king's authority. They emphasized that he persisted in making his petitions to his God. Deeply distressed, the king realized the trap set for Daniel but was determined to save him. He labored until sunset, seeking a way to rescue Daniel from the den of lions. The conspirators returned explaining to the king that the law of the Medes and Persians could not be altered. Regrettably, the king had no choice but to order Daniel's imprisonment in the den of lions. However, he expressed his faith in Daniel's God, believing that he would deliver him. A stone was placed over the den's mouth, sealed with the king's signet and those of his nobles, securing the purpose of Daniel's confinement. The king returned to his palace, fasting, with no music or entertainment as he could not sleep that night. He arose early the next morning and hurried to the den of lions. With a mournful voice, the king called out to Daniel, inquiring if the god he continually served had preserved him from the lion's grasp. Daniel responded to the king, wishing him longevity, and proclaimed that his god had sent an angel who had closed the lion's mouths. God had found Daniel innocent, and he had done no harm to the king either. Overjoyed, the king ordered Daniel to be lifted out of the den. Miraculously, Daniel had suffered no injury because of his unwavering faith in God. King Darius then decreed that the men who had falsely accused Daniel, along with their families, should be thrown into the den of lions. Before they even reached the bottom, the lions overpowered them, breaking their bones to pieces. Darius, in his wisdom, composed a letter to all the people, nations, and languages dwelling throughout the earth, wishing them peace and prosperity. He declared that everyone in his kingdom should tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, the living God, eternal, whose kingdom would never be destroyed, and whose dominion would endure forever. This God delivered Daniel from the power of the lions and performed signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. As a result, Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and continued to do so under the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Daniel chapter 7 In the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions while lying on his bed. He recorded the dream and its essential details. Daniel began to speak and said, I saw a vision at night. The four winds of heaven stirred up the great sea, 
and from it emerged four distinct and remarkable beasts. The first beast resembled a lion with eagle's wings. I watched as its wings were plucked, and it was lifted from the ground, standing upright like a man, and a human heart was given to it. Next, I saw a second beast, resembling a bear. It was raised up on one side, and it held three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. A voice told it to devour much flesh. Then, in my vision, I saw a third beast, like a leopard, with four wings of a bird on its back and four heads. It was granted dominion. Afterward, I saw a fourth beast in my night visions. It was dreadful and exceedingly strong, with great iron teeth. It devoured and crushed everything, and it trampled the rest underfoot. This beast was unlike any of the previous ones, and it had ten horns. As I contemplated the horns, another small horn emerged, displacing three of the original horns. This new horn had eyes like a man and spoke great things. While I observed this vision, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His robe was white as snow, and his hair was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, with wheels of burning fire. A stream of fire issued forth from before him, and thousands upon thousands served him, while ten thousand times ten thousand stood in his presence. The court was convened, and the books were opened. As I listened to the boastful words spoken by the horn, I watched until the beast was slain, and its body was destroyed and cast into the burning flame. As for the other beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Then, in my night visions, I saw one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. To him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom so that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom will never be destroyed. This vision troubled me deeply, and the visions of my head greatly disturbed me. So I approached one of those standing by and asked for the true meaning of all this. He explained it to me and made known the interpretations. These four great beasts represent four kings who will arise from the earth but the saints of the Most High will receive and possess the kingdom forever, even for all eternity. I was particularly interested in the fourth beast, which was unlike the others, exceedingly dreadful, with iron teeth and bronze claws. It devoured and crushed its victims, and it trampled the rest underfoot. I also inquired about the ten horns on its head and the emergence of the small horn that uprooted three others. This horn had eyes like a man and spoke arrogantly and its appearance was more imposing than its companions. I observed as this horn waged war against the saints and prevailed over them, but this continued until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was rendered in favor of the saints of the Most High. The time arrived when they possessed the kingdom. Then I was told that the fourth beast represents a fourth kingdom on earth, distinct from all the others, which will consume and crush the entire earth. The ten horns symbolize ten kings who will arise from this kingdom, and another king will arise after them, different from the earlier ones, who will subdue three kings. This king will speak against the Most High, oppress his saints, and intend to change the set times and laws. The saints will be handed over to him for a time, times, and half a time. Yet the court will convene, and his dominion will be taken away, consumed, and utterly destroyed forever. The kingdom, dominion, and greatness of the entire kingdom under heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will serve and obey him. This concludes the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts deeply troubled me, and my countenance changed, but I kept these matters in my heart. Daniel Chapter 8 in the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, received another vision, following the one I had earlier. In this vision, I found myself in the city of Shushan, within the palace located in the province of Elam, standing beside the Eli River. As I looked up, I saw a ram standing by the river, having two horns, with one horn higher than the other, and the higher one coming up last. This ram charged westward, northward, and southward, 
and no beasts could stand against it. It did as it pleased and grew exceedingly great. While I pondered this, a male goat came from the west, moving so swiftly it did not touch the ground. The goat had a prominent horn between its eyes. The goat approached the ram by the river, rushing at it with great fury. Drawing near, the goat was filled with anger against the ram, striking it, breaking its two horns. The ram had no strength to withstand the goat, and the goat cast it down to the ground, trampling over it. No one could rescue the ram from the goat's power. Subsequently, the male goat grew exceedingly powerful. But when it was at its height, the large horn was broken, and four notable horns sprouted up in its place, extending toward the four winds of heaven. From one of these four horns, a smaller horn emerged, and it grew exceedingly great, extending to the south, the east, and toward the beautiful land. This horn became mighty, even waging war against the heavenly host, casting down some of the stars and the host to the ground and trampling on them. It even exalted itself against the prince of the heavenly host, removing the daily sacrifices and defiling the sanctuary. A host was given to this horn due to transgression and it cast down the truth to the ground and prospered in its deceitful actions. While I observed this, one saint inquired of another how long this vision of the daily sacrifice and the transgressions that bring desolation would continue, along with the sanctuary and the host being trampled underfoot. The response was, For two thousand and three hundred days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Upon seeing this vision and seeking its meaning, I suddenly beheld a figure resembling a man standing before me. I heard a voice calling out from between the banks of the Ulai River, addressing Gabriel, instructing him to help me understand the vision. Gabriel approached me, and as he came near, I was overcome with fear and fell on my face. But he told me to understand, for this vision pertains to the time of the end. While he spoke with me, I fell into a deep sleep, my face on the ground. He touched me and raised me to my feet. He said, Behold, I will make known to you what will happen at the end of the indignation, for it is appointed to occur at a specific time. He explained that the ram with two horns represents the kings of Media and Persia. The rough goat symbolizes the king of Greece, and the prominent horn between its eyes is the first king. When that horn was broken, for kingdoms will arise from the nation, but they will not have the same power. In the latter days of these kingdoms, when transgressors reach their full measure, a king with a fierce countenance and an understanding of dark schemes will stand up. This king's power will be mighty, but not of his own making. He will cause incredible destruction and prosperity, practicing deceit and harming the mighty and the holy people. Through his cunning, he will promote deceit and magnify himself, even standing against the prince of princes. However, he will be destroyed, not by human hands. The vision of the evening and morning is true, so seal up this vision, as it will remain relevant for many days. After this revelation I, Daniel, felt weak and became ill for some days. Then I rose and attended to the king's affairs, astonished by the vision's significance, but no one around me understood it. Daniel chapter 9 In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of Median descent, who became king over the Chaldean realm, I, Daniel, came to understand through reading the scriptures that the word of the Lord had come to the prophet Jeremiah, predicting that seventy years would pass before the desolations of Jerusalem were completed. Upon this revelation, I turned my attention to the Lord God, seeking Him earnestly through prayer, supplication, fasting, and by wearing sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, saying, O Lord, the great and fearsome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy for those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned, committed iniquity, acted wickedly, and rebelled against your commandments and judgments. We have not heeded the words of your prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, princes, fathers, and all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness but to us belongs shame and confusion, as it is this day, to the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all Israel, near and far, in all the countries where you have driven us because of our unfaithfulness. O Lord, to us belongs shame and confusion, to our kings, princes, and fathers, 
because we have sinned against you. But to the Lord our God belong compassion and forgiveness, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and has turned aside, not obeying your voice. Therefore, the curse and oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us, for we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us, by bringing upon us a great disaster. For under the whole heaven such has never been done as what has happened to Jerusalem, as it is written in the law of Moses. Yet we have not made our supplication before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Therefore, the Lord kept watch over the disaster and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works he does, yet we have not obeyed his voice. Now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name, as it is this day, we have sinned, we have acted wickedly. O Lord, in accordance with all your righteous acts, let your anger and wrath turn away from your city Jerusalem, your holy mountain. For because of our sins and the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a reproach to all those around us. Now therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his pleas for mercy. And for your own sake, O Lord, let your face shine upon your desolate sanctuary. Incline your ear, O my God, and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolation and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act without delay, for your own sake, O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. While I was still speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for his holy mountain. Gabriel, the man I had seen in a previous vision, approached me swiftly, flying towards me around the time of the evening offering. He came near me, and when he did, I was overcome with fear and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, O son of man, for the vision pertains to the time of the end. While he spoke to me, I fell into a deep sleep my face on the ground. But he touched me and stood me upright. He said, Look, I will make you understand what will happen at the end of the indignation, for it refers to the appointed time. The ram with two horns that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia. The male goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between its eyes is the first king. The horn was broken, and four kingdoms shall arise from that nation, though not with its power. In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their full measure, a king of bold countenance and skilled in intrigue shall arise. He will wield great power but not by his own authority. He will cause terrible destruction and succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy the mighty and the holy people. Through his cunning, he will use deceit successfully. He will be proud in his own mind and destroy many while they are at ease. He will even rise up against the prince of princes, but he will be broken, though not by human hands. The vision of the evenings and mornings that you have heard is true, but seal up the vision, for it refers to many days yet to come. Afterward I, Daniel, was overwhelmed and sick for several days. Then I got up and resumed the king's business, still astonished by the vision, but unable to grasp its meaning. Daniel chapter 10 In the third year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, a revelation came to Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar. The revelation was indeed true, but its fulfillment was set for a distant time. Daniel comprehended the vision and understood it. During those days I, Daniel, mourned for a full three weeks. I refrained from consuming delightful foods, meat, and wine. I did not anoint myself with oil for the entire three weeks. Then, on the twenty-fourth day of the first month, I found myself beside the great river, known as the Tigris. I raised my eyes and saw a figure dressed in linen, with a belt of fine gold from up as around his waist. His body had the appearance of beryl, his face shone like lightning, his eyes were like blazing torches, 
His arms and feet gleamed like polished brass, and his voice echoed like a multitude. I, Daniel, was the only one who witnessed this vision. The men with me did not see it, but they were seized by a great trembling and fled to hide themselves. So, I was left alone to witness this remarkable vision, and my strength entirely left me. My countenance turned pale, and I had no strength remaining. Nevertheless, I could hear the voice of his words. When I heard his words, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. Then a hand touched me and raised me onto my knees and palms. He spoke to me, saying, Daniel, you are greatly beloved. Understand the words that I speak to you, and stand upright, for I have been sent to you. When he uttered these words, I stood trembling. He reassured me, saying, Do not fear, Daniel. From the very first day you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. However, the prince of the kingdom of Persia opposed me for twenty-one days. But then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to assist me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision pertains to a time far in the future. After he spoke these words to me, I turned my face toward the ground and remained silent. Then, one who resembled a human touched my lips, and I opened my mouth and spoke. I said to the one standing before me, My lord, the vision has caused my sorrows, and I have lost all my strength. How can the servant of my lord converse with my lord? For as for me, there is no strength left in me, and I have no breath. Once again, one who resembled a man touched me, and he strengthened me. He said, O man greatly beloved, do not fear. Peace be with you, be strong, yes, be strong. After he spoke to me, I regained my strength and said, Speak, my lord, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? I am now returning to fight against the prince of Persia, and when I depart, the prince of Greece will come. But first, I will reveal to you what is written in the Book of Truth. No one supports me in these matters except Michael, your prince. Daniel chapter 11 I also, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I, stood to confirm and strengthen him. Now, I will reveal the truth to you. There will be three more kings in Persia, and the fourth will be wealthier than all of them. Through his riches, he will stir up conflict against the realm of Greece. Then, a mighty king will rise, who will rule with great dominion and do as he pleases. However, when he reaches the height of his power, his kingdom will be broken and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not to his descendants, nor will it have the same authority that he once had, for his kingdom will be uprooted and given to others. The king of the south will become strong, as will one of his princes, who will gain even greater power and dominion. After some years, they will form an alliance through the marriage of the king of the south's daughter to the king of the north, but she will not retain her power, and neither he nor his arm will last. In those times, she will be handed over, along with those who brought her, her father, and those who supported her. A descendant from her roots will arise to take her place. He will come with an army, enter the fortress of the king of the north, and engage in conflict, prevailing against them. He will also carry their gods, princes, and precious silver and gold vessels as captives to Egypt. For some years, he will continue to hold power over the king of the north. The king of the south will then invade the king's territory, but his sons will assemble a great army and advance like a flood, but they will retreat to their stronghold. The king of the south will be infuriated and go into battle with the king of the north, who will muster a large army but be delivered into the hand of his enemy. After the defeat of the multitude, his heart will be lifted up, and he will cast down tens of thousands, but he will not prevail. For the king of the north will return with a larger army than before, coming after several years with a great army and abundant resources. In those times, many will rise up against the king of the south, and violent people among your own people will rebel to establish their own vision, but they will fail. The king of the north will then lay siege to well-fortified cities, and the forces of the south, along with his chosen people, will be unable to withstand him, 
and they will have no strength to resist. He will do as he pleases and set up camp in the glorious land, causing destruction by his own hand. He will set his mind to come with his entire kingdom, and will make an agreement with the king of the south, offering his daughter in marriage, but it will not succeed, and she will not be on his side. Afterward, he will turn his attention to the coastal regions and capture many, but a commander will put an end to his approach and will make him suffer disgrace. He will turn back and vent his fury against the holy covenant. He will take action and return to his own land. At the appointed time, he will return to the south, but it will not be as it was before. Ships from Cyprus will come against him, causing him to be disheartened. He will return with rage against the Holy Covenant, taking action, and he will favor those who abandon the Holy Covenant. He will set up forces to desecrate the sanctuary, abolishing the daily sacrifice and setting up the abomination that causes desolation. He will corrupt those who act wickedly against the covenant with flattery, but the people who know their God will stand firm and take action. Those who are wise among the people will give understanding to many, but for a time, they will fall by sword, flame, captivity, and plunder. When they fall, they will receive a little help, but many will join them insincerely. Some of the wise will stumble so that they may be refined, purified, and made spotless until the time of the end, for it awaits an appointed time. The king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. He will prosper until the time of wrath is completed, for what has been decreed must be accomplished. He will not show regard for the gods of his ancestors or the one desired by women, nor will he show regard for any god, for he will magnify himself above all. Instead, he will honor a god of fortresses, a god his ancestors did not know, with gold, silver, precious stones, and riches. He will reward those who support him with fortresses. He will attack the strongest fortresses with the help of a foreign god and will greatly honor those who acknowledge him, making them rulers over many and distributing land as a reward. At the time of the end, the king of the south will engage him in battle, but the king of the north will storm against him with chariots, horsemen, and many ships. He will invade countries and sweep through them like a flood. He will also invade the beautiful land, and many will fall. But these will escape from his power. Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of the Ammonites. He will extend his power against the countries, and not even the land of Egypt will escape. He will gain control over the hidden treasures of gold and silver and over all the riches of Egypt. The Libyans and Cushites will also be under his authority. But reports from the east and the north will alarm him, and he will set out in great anger to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch his royal tents between the sea and the beautiful holy mountain. Yet he will come to his end, with no one to help him. Daniel chapter 12 And in that time Michael, the great prince who stands for the children of your people, shall arise. It will be a time of trouble unlike any that has occurred since the nation's beginning, and at that time, your people whose names are found written in the book shall be delivered. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awaken, some to everlasting life, and others to shame and everlasting contempt. The wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, seal up these words and close the book until the time of the end. Many will roam about, and knowledge will increase. Then I, Daniel, looked, and saw two others standing, one on this side of the river bank, and the other on that side. One of them asked the man clothed in linen, who was standing above the waters of the river, How long will it be until the end of these wonders? The man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, raised his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by the Eternal One that it would be for a time, times, and half a time, and when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things will be fulfilled. I heard, but I did not understand, so I asked, My Lord, what will be the outcome of these things? He replied, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are sealed and closed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, cleansed, and refined, 
but the wicked will continue to act wickedly. None of the wicked will understand, but the wise will understand. From the time the daily sacrifice is abolished, and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be one thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is the one who waits and reaches the one thousand three hundred and thirty-five days. But as for you, go your way until the end. You will rest, and then at the end of the days, you will rise to your allotted inheritance.